Ahmed, he is a um, consultant, an energy and environmental consultant working with Sedari. Sedari is, a, is the center for environment and development for the Arab region and Europe. So a big scope. And actually, Sedari was one of the organizations who gave us a letter of support for our ISD program. Because they work in a very integrated way. They also work on the connection between the different MENA countries and Europe, like the ISD program. And in that sense, it's great, uh, because we never got any lectures by anybody really linked with the Sedari. So, um, that's great, you are representing them, and at the same time you have the double role of being a PhD student in Humboldt University and um, doing your research on topics of sustainable transportation, especially related to uh, Greater Cairo, which of course for us also is of a very specific interest, and you have been involved in many projects, consultancy projects, both on environmental impact assessment, but also on transportation planning and trying to integrate the different uh, perspectives. Um, and therefore, I think it's um, a great opportunity that we are able now to uh, get your experience um, from Cairo, as we in Stuttgart are also very actively now discussing about the topics of sustainable mobility. We just um, are preparing for the launch of a so-called reality lab, which is in cooperation with the municipality, the region, and many other agencies to talk about sustainable mobility in Stuttgart and also use the term mobility rather than transportation or traffic. Because we also believe that mobility means much more than just traffic planning. And I think you share that perspective also, the wide perspective of um, what mobility actually means and how to link that to wider de debates without having already a preconceived views on either our ah, cars are bad, we only go for pedestrians or uh, we need a car-oriented city. And in Stuttgart this is also a very hot topic. Just yesterday there was a big article in the, in the newspaper discussing on these issues because many people feel that Stuttgart is far too car-oriented um, and hardly walkable, and you find hardly any bicycles, so we also have these debates, but I think in Cairo, of course, the debate is on a much larger level, c considering the challenges of a mega city. So we are really looking forward to your lecture, as we also are hoping to work a bit in this research field, maybe also connected with some further research and some uh, master thesis, whatever, and also maybe to share with you. And, and integrate you into our discussions and so we are very happy that you now became connected Thank with the you. ISD program. So welcome again to Stuttgart and to ISD and we are looking forward to your lecture. Thank you very much for this <laughs> nice introduction. Uh, so hello everyone, uh, my name is Ahmed Durbami. Um, I like very much the way uh, you just found the word mobility highlighted now the introduction of my presentation, uh, rather than using transportation. Um, today in this presentation, I want to add many words to your vocabulary and many concepts that are very important for urban planners uh, and architects. Um, one of them is mobility, and sometimes I would also like to use the word accessibility, uh, because planners are not just planning for the mobility of people, but their access to their needs, meaning jobs, education, uh, leisure, maintenance activities like shopping, etc. Uh, so planners more and more are not asking the question, how do you go from point A to point B, and how fast do you do that, and so on, but rather, why? And when you start with the question why you need to do this and that, you can find many diverse solutions and alternatives that reduce your dependence on fuel and vehicles and so on. Uh, one example is what we were planning for today, for example, teleconferencing of this conference, etc. Because it's looking from the why we need to, uh, to meet this demand of disseminating information, for example. Uh, so starting with why is very important. Um, this was the picture in my introduction in my announcement. Uh, this was taken during uh, the environmental impact assessment field studies uh, for the fourth metro line of Greater Cairo. And this was a turning point in my career because I started as an environmental engineer 
And then I got very interested in transportation because when you make an EIA study, part it's, it's an environmental and social impact assessment. So it means that you have to start by, with a reconnaissance survey, you walk through the entire corridor. In this case, it was 34 kilometers across the entire of Cairo, starting from the pyramids, across the Nile, uh, and up towards the next <coughs> governor, uh, Khalil Bay. Uh, and through this survey, you have to meet all of the stakeholders that might be affected by this uh, metro, whether beneficiaries or people who would be adversely impacted, and, and so on. And you meet a lot of NGOs, <laughs> business owners along the corridor, schools, hospitals, uh, hotels and business, everything. Uh, and this was really an eye-opener because I realized how even me as an Egyptian living in Cairo, usually I think uh, the representation of Cairo in my imagination are the very few spots I go to. And it's probably the same for you. Uh, so it's probably the main streets that you use and your school, your university, the few malls maybe that you go to, soccer field and so on. But you are really not aware of the majority of, uh, of the city. And an exercise like this really opened my eyes uh, to the diversity and, and all of the different needs of the 20 million people that are in this mega city. Uh, and this is what I want to uh, convey to you, in, hopefully, in an hour. So where is this? This is an island in the Nile, El Mania. Um, and the metro is supposed to go under it, basically. We already have uh, two, two lines that are uh, going under uh, the Nile. Uh, this is the fourth metro line. Okay. I will start by giving a global overview of transportation. Just to add to your vocabulary, before I go to the case study of Cairo. Um, the megacity, there are many definitions of, of a, a megacity, but generally the most common is exceeding 10 million. Recently they're talking about exceeding 20 million. Uh, it's mostly in the developing world and it's challenged by immense needs for transportation, for all of the needs that I just uh, uh, mentioned. Uh, and accessibility to jobs and education and leisure and commerce uh, and so on. Um, and the reason I'm so interested in megacities because they're almost all in the developing countries, like Lagos, Cairo, Mumbai, and Delhi, and so on, with a few exceptions, such as New York uh, or Tokyo in developed countries. They're mostly in the developing countries, and the developing countries are what constitute the majority of the global population. And this draws a lot my interest, because I'm really interested in researching things that will serve the global majority. Um, So I'll start talking about uh, what are the common dilemmas that you find in, uh, in megacities uh, exceeding 20 million. This, this figure were cities that are in the metropolitan area exceeding 20 million. Um, there's a vicious circle of urban degradation. Uh, some deficiencies in land use management. Uh, urbanization from the rural areas, which happened a lot in Greater Cairo in search for jobs as the farmlands are being fragmented and, and reduced and the population is growing very rapidly. Um, the demand for transportation increases very quickly. I mean, if you're having a million and a half babies every year, your population is growing very fast. You need a lot. If the supply of transportation, metro and tram and so on, it's not catching up with this demand, then the people will have to find their own solutions. Their own solutions for housing, for businesses, for transportation, and hence you have these words, informal transport, informal housing, informal businesses, and so on. Uh, in the case of transportation, this leads often to co congestion. Uh, and on the, other, on the other hand as well, the solutions that are being uh, proposed are very often centered around the car, as we just heard about serving the car, increasing the road space. You have congestion, have more roads, make it, make it wider. But the truth is that 
leading research in developed countries of many case studies in cities around the world showed that building more roads creates, invites more traffic, invites more fuel consumption, invites more cars. So more roads is not a solution. Furthermore, if you look at income increases, uh, usually transportation is coupled with transportation is coupled with economic uh, growth. But a lot of the, the international debate now is how do we decouple transportation from economic growth so that you have uh, cities like, like today actually is happening in Europe, that the rate of motorization, even though it's high, but the use of the car is not increasing as fast as it used to, starting to steady. Actually, G Germany is one of these cases. The, 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 the rate of applying for licensing among youth in Germany is, uh, is declining now. So the interest in the car is declining. Even though there are lots of cars and they're being sold a lot, but the use is, is declining. Uh, there's a lot of proof and many good examples that it is possible to achieve economic growth and to have progress and sustainability without being tied with, uh, with transportation and increased demand, demand on, on cars. Um, I will talk a lot more about this, uh, this circle in my presentation. Uh, I just want to alarm you for a second about the car ownership in this world that we live in today. This is, this is a very nice uh, graph. It is showing the, how the GDP per capita, as it increases, okay, the car ownership measured in the number of cars per 1,000 inhabitants tends to be associated with GDP growth so far. With one of the highest, or maybe the highest in the world, being Luxembourg. And behind are countries like India, China, Egypt, Russia, Ethiopia, and so on. Many developing countries. But if you notice, most of the population are gathered here. These are actually overlapping bubbles of many developing countries. And the question is here. We, when we are talking about interest in economic growth, GDP goes up and so on, does this mean that these bubbles will go up? that all of the cars that we find on the planet today will double and triple with time. Um, this graph, you will find it in the International Monetary Fund's Global Economic Outlook um, of 2008 in the chapter about climate change. Warning the world about the threat that there is from the increasing culture of car ownership and car use around the world, and if all of these, the majority of the 7 billion that inhabit the planet today, start adapting to the same culture, of uh, the same trajectory of the developed countries in the past, before there, the corrections that are happening now. If they repeat all of these mistakes, what will happen in terms of climate change? And this is what the graph is saying what will happen if these populations go up. But it's not just climate change, it's noise, use of public space in the cities, uh, motorization of the rich people and marginalization of the poor, and many other issues um, that are threatened, air pollution and, and so on. Uh, even though China is behind, for example, at one stage in, in time, um, the Shanghai Olympics were going to be cancelled just because of air pollution, if you remember. Uh, so this is a very important issue to think about um, when we are talking about sustain, uh, planning for sustainable cities. Uh, so I talked about it's not just climate change, but many, up, sorry, many other environmental pressures, noise, air pollution, so on. Economic pressures as well, because many of these countries subsidize the fuel. So if you have more users of the fuel, like, like in Egypt, for example, and many other countries, uh, then it's an economic burden on the government itself. So it's not just pollution, but it's also uh, economic. Uh, infrastructure costs, uh, money that should rather than go to roads, go to schools and hospitals in de developing countries. Um, and also uh, energy uh, shortages. 
social pressures uh, as well. Uh, one of my most interesting parts of this, of this discussion is the loss of public space which we are experiencing uh, very harshly in, in, in Greater Cairo now, especially that the, the city is full of cultural heritage as well. And many other impacts. So basically what we need is a paradigm shift from the vehicle-centered paradigm to the people-centered paradigm. From the how do we get from point A to B to why? why do, what do people, do people need to do? How can we help them get a better education, get access to medical care, have a more so socially equitable life, have a more livable city, and so on. And this is the starting point. And then the transportation planning comes later. Uh, an example of a people-centered paradigm shift is one of my favorites in, I hope I pronounce it correctly, Shong Ye Shong, uh, uh, it's, it's a greenway uh, in Seoul. Uh, and this was originally uh, a highway, an expressway, a double-decker. Uh, and it was a very harsh environment, and it was uh, converted to uh, a boulevard pedestrian area with, uh, with there's also a cultural center, and, and then they realized later, this was one of several uh, case studies um, in a report that I will talk about uh, soon. Um, they talked also about how the real estate value went up. So the, even the economic, if you want to talk in terms of dollars, the economic impact was also positive on the entire city. Uh, and then, of course, when people are happier, they produce better and so on. So there's also the economic argument. But culturally and socially and so on, there was a very uh, good improvement. And in parallel to this, there were plans for public transportation to absorb the, the offset uh, traffic and other measures as well to reduce the need for traffic. Um, and speaking of reduction, you know how in recycling there's the, the rule, the three R's, who knows this? I mean, almost everyone. Uh, reduce, reuse, recycle. There's something similar in transportation. Avoid, shift, improve. So if someone comes to me, a planner, and he says, old school, he's old school, uh, we need to widen this road because it's congestion, then I'll tell them, no, avoid, shift, improve. Avoid means avoid the work in the first place. This is the why. Why do we transport? Uh, for example, telework, telecommuting, uh, smarter lifestyles and better decisions on how to schedule your day and how to schedule your life, your job, uh, your choice of the housing location, your choice of your work location, uh, the, the, the planning phase, land use planning. Land use planning has a lot of impact on, on transportation. You compare, for example, uh, a dense city like Hong Kong to uh, a city like Atlanta in the U.S., which is among the highest fuel consumers per capita in transportation in the world, uh, or Houston. You can see how much, just from the land use uh, phase, you can impact transportation, people li people's lives, accessibility, and the quality of life. So there are, there's a lot to do and avoid, and the list is much longer. Uh, Secondly, shift. Shift means shift to more sustainable modes, uh, such as to public transportation, uh, cycling, walking, uh, and, and so on. And lastly, improve. You do have cars that are existing, and it's a reality. Uh, so the third uh, component is to improve uh, the performance of the vehicles uh, in terms of uh, fuel consumption and, uh, and noise reduction and so on. So avoid, shift, improve. If I introduce this as my mix of solutions, my, my inspiration for a mix of solutions, the road will be the same size and it can even be demolished. And the, the traffic and the city planning and the mobility and accessibility will improve. This is just to tell you that there are, all, there are a lot of measures for mobility management. It's called Travel Demand Management. I just want to add it to your vocabulary, TDM. Or you can call it Mobility Management, which means uh, don't build roads, just uh, implement first Travel Demand Management 
measures. I won't read it out, I'll just give one example or a couple of examples. Uh, there can be fiscal incentives such as fuel taxes. Uh, there can be, uh, for example, clustered land use. So land use planning is, is improved so that, uh, for example, in Cuba in the 90s, uh, there's a good example. They had an energy crisis in the 90s because the, the Soviet Union, the, the use uh, collapsed. Uh, and then their source of oil was gone, their major source of oil was gone, and suddenly they have an energy crisis, which is a bit like what the world will go through in a few years, uh, probably, after the peak oil period. So what did Cuba uh, do? They made a lot of similar measures, not increase the roads, not uh, put more cars, uh, but they increased public transportation. Uh, the, the large schools were split into smaller schools, so that each neighborhood is closer to their school and they can go walking or cycling, uh, building, uh, building uh, bicycle factories. And, and it, it seems from a few, a few years later from an uh, observer that they were actually doing a lot of sustainable development measures. It was a response to energy, but actually, uh, I mean, even in agriculture, they were switching from chemical energy intensive fertilizers to organic. Uh, farming practices, which need much less energy. So when you when you look at all of this, you, you start to think about how much impact you can have by alternative means, by smarter uh, decisions in development and in planning. Uh, and these are called soft measures. Another word for vocab: soft measures such as mobility management, uh, such as uh, promoting ride sharing, which is happening a lot in Germany, um, <coughs> flexi time at work, innovation in the work culture. So all of these are measures that can improve a lot of the, the life of, of people. And it is in the context of uh, improving transportation. Okay. Uh, so in terms of the supply and the choices of transportation, I really like to show this uh, this image that sums up how we should think about uh, moving around. Uh, this is like a nutrition pyramid. It's a reverse traffic pyramid, which is basically saying that the majority of our trips, when you're planning, whether policy or land use planning or urban planning and so on, walking and running, cycling, bicycles and other utilities, public transport, ideally if you can stop here, this would be great. Uh, of course, you, you still need uh, uh, cars, but if you use cars, then uh, work on policies for car sharing, ride sharing, uh, public cars, and so on. Um, then finally, the more polluting per capita, uh, the car, and, and of course, traveling by plane. Uh, and before I start talking about my case study, Cairo, I want to also add what am I doing in time? Good. Uh, to add BRT to your book. Who, who has heard about bus rapid transit before? That's very good. Uh, so basically, this is a very big, uh, it's a very hot topic now in, uh, in many cities of the developing world. Because what happened is in, in Curitiba, uh, maybe 20 years ago or something, uh, there was uh, a very a visionary mayor there, Kai Milan, maybe you know him. Um, I believe he was an architect as well. Uh, and he introduced in a small city, Curitiba, which you probably use a lot in case studies about sustainability because it's always showcased for, for many good examples. Um, he showed how he can build a system that has completely separated uh, bus lanes, not lines li uh, like you usually see, but physically separated. So it's like a metro, it moves much faster, its capacity with the bi-articulated buses is much larger, and the stations are different in that they are uh, elevated, you can only access it from the station, and, and ideally you can have uh, the, the fares being picked up before you enter the bus. So basically it's like a metro, but it's much, much cheaper, and much faster to build. And here was a proof of concept that was repeated in Bogota, and Bogota was the real star, because in Bogota, uh, also under one of the, the, the 
celebrity mayors of the world, Enrique Peñalosa. Um, they built, for the first time, they built a bus rapid transit system in a major city, in a much bigger, uh, to serve a much bigger population. Because Curitiba was small, they said that BRT will only serve small cities. But this was the first proof of concept in Bogota, in a larger, in a large city. Uh, and then in the next years, tens of other cities are starting to plan how to build a proper uh, bus rapid transit. But what you don't see in this picture is a lot more. A lot more that people from your disciplines have been doing in Bogota. Which is the social aspects, the different policies, and improving the land use management, uh, integrating the, the urban planning to accommodate the bus rapid transit and the feeding the feeder buses, uh, and a lot of other upgrading such as uh, uh, building bicycle lanes, pedestrian pathways, and many things that will serve people once you start restricting the car, so providing the alternatives in advance. So what you have at the end is an upgrade of the city, and an upgrade of the culture as well, of mobility in the city. Um, If you look at the sector, the, the spectrum towards the bus rapid transit, it starts with, I mean, the least organized transportation is when there isn't any government-led uh, provision of transport, uh, informal transit, which I will talk a lot about today, because this is actually a characteristic of almost all uh, megacities of the world. Uh, and it's very important, and I'll talk also about its virtues. And then, Governments are trying very hard. There's been a recent forum in Leipzig, actually, uh, with many uh, stakeholders from African cities. There's one next, next week in Nairobi as well, um, also another forum, talking about bus rapid transit and cycling and walking and pedestrianization in developing countries. So this is something that's really happening around the world now, especially in developing countries that are growing very quickly in population. Um, so how does the key characteristic of, uh, of, of these megacities, paratransit, informal transportation, uh, how does it serve people? What share of their trips is depending on informal transport? Uh, you'll find that many cities, such as Cairo, Algeria, Qatar, and so on, half or more than half in many cases are depending on uh, informal transportation. Uh, there are different stances from different cities, from prohibition, but it's a reality, but turn a blind eye on it, uh, acceptance, recognition, and regulation. Uh, ideally, with the regulation, you can avoid the many uh, problems that come with uh, informal transportation, um, because it does provide access to the poor and difficult to reach neighborhoods, you have smaller vehicles and so on and the increase in demand is being served, all of this is good, but you also have, it's unregulated, so you have competition over the passengers. So crazy driving, which is uh, a bit unsafe, and you might have some labor rights issues as well, if you're talking about the drivers themselves. If it's not in a formal system, then nobody is monitoring the, the, the labor issues as well. So these are very important characteristics of, of paratransit. Uh, so what I'm saying here that, number one, it's very important and it's a reality and we have to deal with it. Secondly, is that there are problems, but it's, it's not about prohibiting or turning a blind eye on it, but understand the reality and try to deal, point out, weed out the problems and uh, treat them uh, one by one. And this is what's happening uh, around the world today in, in, in many cities. Um, so, the virtues of paratransit, and by paratransit, I don't only mean microbuses, but any other transportation that happens by entrepreneurs, usually in the poorer areas, to take advantage of this demand. There are people who want to make money, need to make a living, and people who have a need, and they are uh, all very good entrepreneurs who are meeting these needs. 
Uh, and around cities of the world, there are varying degrees of, uh, of problems in, uh, in power transit. So you might have areas in, for example, in Lagos, it's, the sector is, has a history of a lot of uh, aggression on problems and setting fares very high. But you have other countries as well who have seen a sector that is very good in self-organizing, very autonomous, adapting to the demand very quickly, sometimes even much better than the government. So paratransit, accounting for more than 50% of the trips, is something that we really have to research into when we're talking about the future of, the, of, of our cities. Um, another disadvantage as well is, of course, the minimum standards for, for quality and, and vehicle safety, which has to be part of the gradual regulation of uh, of paratransit. Um, this picture here is a picture that uh, that we took in uh, the expansions of Greater Cairo, in New Cairo, and there's a very important message here. As you can see behind, this gives a hint that this is generally a high income area compared to the rest of Cairo, and it is. This is an area called the Fifth Settlement, uh, and you still have not only informal, this one, but you have informal, informal, you have a double, this is semi-regulated, and this one is even uh, way below the radar, the government's radar. Uh, so the sector is even vibrant in the rich areas, for a very simple reason, because you had construction workers building the buildings there, then you have staff of all of these companies that are opening there, and so on. Uh, obviously, it is still a reality, even as the city expands, and even if you have more uh, uh, high-income high uh, uh, suburbs or expansions. Okay. Now, finally, talking about uh, Egypt. Uh, we've exceeded 90 million, <coughs> the population right now. Uh, Egypt, they say, it's the present of the Nile. Because, because of the Nile, there is Egypt. Um, Cairo is located over here. It's, it's a small dot, has more than 20 million people. 95% uh, of the population of Egypt live only on 5% of the land. And this will this explains a bit why many of the cities are very dense. The cities located along the Nile and in the Delta. And one of the big problems is the increasing car ownership. There is one topic that has to come up in every encounter, social encounter in Egypt, which is traffic. You come late to a meeting, you say, sorry, I'm late because of, uh, of traffic. During the meeting, you say, ah, sorry, I have to, uh, to leave early because just to catch the, you know, to make time for the traffic. Uh, traffic is always part of, uh, during the meeting, you say, oh, sorry, I have a headache. It's just because of traffic. So it's really an integral part of our life, complaining about traffic. But what I've noticed when I compare it, when I compare the car ownership in Cairo, in Egypt, to the car ownership in other countries in the developed world, we have less complaints about transportation. Something very interesting is, is very obvious here, that whereas countries such as Germany exceeds 500 cars per capita, uh, Egypt is very low. It's very low. It's Egypt is 35, Greater Cairo is more dense, so it's 95 cars per, per capita. So this tells us something. First of all, it's not just about traffic, there's something going wrong with planning. Uh, number two is that we have the opportunity to avoid the mistakes that many other cities are complaining about. <coughs> complaining about uh, climate change and traffic, such as the IMF uh, graph that I showed earlier, complaining about the public space being excessively taken over by cars, uh, and all of the other environmental and economic uh, aspects. But imagine if, if countries, many other countries, such as Egypt and the developed world, start having the same car ownership, which is actually the current trend, then it would be a, a serious problem. So we're still lucky. Nevertheless, the car, the, the, the car remains the fastest growing uh, vehicle in, in Egypt. 
Don't be fooled by this, this slowdown over here. This was in 2011, of course. Obviously, there were economic uh, uh, difficulties that might have affected the growth of the car ownership. But rest assured that as the economy stands on its legs again, then we continue the same trajectory towards the same trajectory as most of, of economies in transition. So the question is, do we want to have the same future or can we leapfrog into a more sustainable future now that we already have very low dependence on cars? And this is the same argument that should, should and is being told and suggested <coughs> in most of the developing countries in the world, in Asia and Africa and Latin America. How to leapfrog? Okay, Greater Cairo, more than 20 million, low car ownership, this is much less than 500. Only 11% of the households, so all of the traffic you complain about, if I'm talking to the Egyptian group, for example, uh, is attributed to only 11% of, of, of households. So this means there's a lot that we don't see in the city. Uh, and the planning should be directed towards this majority. Okay? Uh, this is an example of one of the uh, traffic-intensive uh, roads in Cairo. So I'm just saying that this is Cairo. Very vibrant city. It's always awake. Uh, so now you're asking 11% only. Uh, what are other people doing? Okay. This is the mode split of Cairo, of Greater Cairo. How are different trips taken? So the, the non-motorized trip, not using a motor basically, walking predominantly, and cycling or other modes. Um, it's about a third and two thirds is motorized. Of this motorized uh, choice, the, 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 the vast majority are using public transportation, not cars. Um, and passenger cars are uh, account for 16% of, of transportation in Egypt, among the other modes. So public transportation is actually the majority already in Egypt. And this is a mode share that is, is actually quite good. Um, if we take only this public transportation and we ask, okay, what types of public transportation? We will find that the majority are using microbuses. Okay, this doesn't come, uh, th this is not very alarming because we also know that the majority of, uh, of housing in Greater Cairo is informal. Actually, about 67% of, of housing uh, in, in Greater Cairo is uh, informal, uh, as I will mention again in a bit. Uh, other modes are uh, transport cooperatives. The, the metro, of course, is, is, is account, accounting for uh, many trips, 16, more than 16%. Uh, tram lines are old. But, um, but also account for some portion, and public buses. So with these two, buses are very important in the transportation, uh, in, in the trips that are being made. Um, the challenges in the sector, as I mentioned before, that, the, that there is, of course, progress, but it's not fast enough. Again, we, are, we have a million, 1.4 million babies every year, and growing very quickly, the demands are growing very quickly. Um, and this is why the informal entrepreneurs take over and they take advantage of this gap and, uh, and provide transportation services. Um, the, uh, of course, there are planning and governance challenges as well, limited fleets and aging vehicles. And the car-centered, the road-building paradigm is still uh, dominating. Uh, but there is still much happening today to transform the city towards a more sustainable and, and there are many positive initiatives that are uh, happening in Egypt. So now I'll take you a trip through the different transportation systems in Egypt very quickly. Something that might, might take you maybe two months to do if you visit Cairo. So this is the, uh, these are the three lines of the metro and the fourth one is also going to across, across uh, Cairo. Uh, started since uh, the late 80s. Uh, it's solving a lot of uh, con uh, congestion problems as well. 
but more than serving to attract the car users and reduce congestion, more than that, it's actually, its function is more of um, a social uh, function because it's, it provides many trips for the poor. Not many car users are switching, so the impact on congestion is not as big as we would imagine when we say there are more than one million trips per day in, in one of these lines and so on. It, but it's serving a lot of uh, uh, poor people. Um, so, uh, there are also tramways, light rail, uh, more than a hundred years old uh, in terms of, of planning when it was uh, started in, in around 1900. Um, today there are three remaining lines and they are gradually being removed as well because the, the planners are thinking of the cheaper alternative, as I mentioned before, bus rapid transit, BRT, uh, and how they can integrate it in, uh, in greater Cairo software. Transportation problems. Uh, it's very important to note that whether I'm talking about the metro or the, the tram or, or the buses, the fare is extremely low. It's one of the lowest in the world, Egypt and India, like Cairo and Delhi, and a few other cities are among the lowest fares uh, in the world. Um, one pound for the metro, for example, to travel 34 kilometers. And one pound, I think this is less than 20 cents. 10 euro cents. Yeah. We're talking euro cents. 10 euro cents. Um, so, uh, of course, one pound versus 26 pounds uh, here, for example, for a much shorter trip, it's, it's a very big difference. Or let's compare it to a developing country, to South <coughs> Africa, for example. In South Africa, it's almost triple the cost in. in uh, um, in Bogota as well, it's uh, many times uh, <coughs> more expensive, so even compared to developing countries. So that's the story of the tram line as well. Uh, the buses, uh, there's uh, a decent fleet, but it's not uh, enough. Uh, some of them are very old, since 1982. Uh, there are attempts for uh, having public-private partnerships to have better governance and so on. But the fact is, we still depend largely on paratransit, on informal transportation. Uh, this is a very minor share, Nile Transport. Uh, uh, but it still exists, the Nile ferries that transfer cars or other, uh, or other boats uh, that also uh, transfer uh, passengers. Um, Taxis, one of the very good initiatives in Egypt was, and it was addressing air pollution, which is a very big issue. Uh, and part of the measures was a scheme for the old taxis up on the, at the age of 20 to be uh, transferred, uh, sort of sold to the government voluntarily, or even at a younger age, uh, and uh, replaced with uh, vehicles running on <coughs> compressed natural gas. And, Compressed natural gas emits less pollutants. It still emits, but much less. Um, and this was one of the climate change projects as well in Egypt. And here we come to the, the big player, the microbus. <laughs> if you remember, the ma vast majority of trips in Greater Cairo, as an example of a mega city, other mega cities, accounts for most of the trips. Uh, in 1977, there was a law that allowed the operation of 811 seated microbuses on fixed routes because what happened is that there, was, there were economic difficulties, we can't catch up with the supply, so entrepreneurs come in and they provide transportation. And it turns out that it's good. They adapt to demand very quickly, they can change their plans, there's no bureaucracy, and, and so on. So semi-regulation started uh, doing its work. And in the 80s, uh, 14 and 18 seat uh, buses were also allowed. A bit later, there were about 14,000 vehicles on 133 uh, routes. Uh, more recently, Giza and Cairo Traffic Administration reported 27,000 uh, cars, but th th there aren't many newer figures about the, the, the numbers of microbuses today. But what we know for sure is the, the real number of routes is, is much more. Um, but 
and it remains today the most commonly used uh, mode, mode of transport. I can uh, think these are the official uh, yeah. licensed cars, right? Uh, the licensed microbus, and and there is the the unofficial as well, yeah. which I showed a can bit earlier. Can you give us like an average percentage? Or? Oh, no, <laughs> possibly. <laughs> no, and and I mean. Um, there are there's a lot of effort going on now by by the ministries and the governors and so on to uh, regain control over monitoring the system and the labor rights and the and the quality and so on. But in reality, in, in field surveys, most of the field surveys uh, say that it, uh, the, the, the 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 people need the service, and it depends on where you study. There are diff various levels of satisfaction, but it's comparable to to that that is provided by the government, so it's comparable as well. Um, and having a very low fare is also a very important aspect. Okay. So, and there's the tuk-tuk. Tuk-tuk is very important, the three-wheeler, the, three the motorized three-wheeler. This has many names. I learned that in Cuba it's called the Kuku. Uh, and the buses are called Wawa. Uh, I, I, but, but I found I found this motorized three wheelers uh, in, in many other countries as well. I, even in Paris, I mean, for the sake of diversifying your options, uh, there are many uh, cities of developing developed world uh, who have introduced things like uh, three wheelers, whether they're motorized or non-motorized, uh, because it's much better in a small city to access roads without taking up so much space. So even in Paris, I spotted uh, they're, they're starting to uh, welcome uh, various ideas. Uh, so it's an emerging phenomenon since the 90s. It's very convenient for dense settlements with narrow streets. It's life-changing for these neighborhoods that are 70% of Egypt. Um, there was, unfortunately, a recent ban on, on imports, but I am sure that this would be re uh, this would be discussed with time. Um, uh, and the ban was, was with the, the concern over uh, security because it, it's very difficult to follow these uh, vehicles when needed, but actually it's a, uh, this is a minority. Uh, and of course there are all, uh, also other small motorized transport. So small is very important in megacities. The small size. There are also other non-motorized transport. They're being used many times for both businesses and for transportation because it's a very flexible uh, sector. Um, and, and not only uh, cycling and animal driven carts, and not only regular cycling, but there's also a, what I will call rebranded cycling. And by rebranded means that cycling has always been stigmatized as the transport of the, of the poor in developing countries. Uh, and there is a very big uh, social movement and environmental movement towards promoting cycling uh, in, in cities, including Cairo. And this is, this is a, a picture I took in one of the cycling rallies. This was in Zemelik, um, that gathered more than uh, 700 uh, cyclists in, in one day to, to promote uh, cycling and healthier lifestyles. Um, so, all of this needs to be integrated in any uh, urban plan to have a sustainable city. Not only this, but if you remember also the traffic, the mobility management measures that I was talking about earlier. Um, so what does this mean? Transportation is not only for the civil engineer and the transportation expert, but it's for, for um, many other disciplines as well. Uh, finally, I'll talk about the current debates, what's going on now, and this is probably similar to many other megacities as well. Uh, what if car growth remains unrestricted? So we go through the same trajectory that we don't want. Cairo loses four football fields. So this 5,000-year-old city with so much cultural amusements and, and beauty and so much density already is losing four football fields worth of space every week. Because of truck and then it, because of the new cars being introduced and no schemes in place to uh, basically scrap or throw away the old vehicles. They're still there, so we're adding to them. So this uh, taking up much more space 
than you can. Um, and this leads us to the next question as well in the debates. Paratransit, is it, is it really a burden? We always complain, oh, the microbuses and the problems and the safety and the crazy drivers and so on. But we just saw that they are serving the majority of the population and same for many other cities. So are, are they really a burden uh, or are they an asset uh, to the city? And if there are any problems with it, we can solve it. But, uh, but the reality is, this is how most of the world will look like in the future, in terms of more splits and, and so on. And this is something that we have to deal with when we're gradually regulating the sector and, and uh, improving it. So if you look at it as an asset, you'll realize that it's providing, providing a lot. This is a picture I took from an airplane uh, on the way here. Um, is a random area in Greater Cairo, and you can see how dense it is. With paratransit, it's, it's possible for these people to access medical care, to access uh, education and jobs and, and all of these things. So many things that in, in one field survey that I did, that I, I realized, because again, the representation of, of any city in, in my mind had always been the small spots that I've been to, the, the roads and so on, but not really a bird's eye view of, of the real city and all of the people not just certain social circles and certain spots. Uh, so the, the, this is the majority and this is who should be prioritized uh, in planning. Uh, and so how do we maintain and improve the, the plans to be pro-poor policies in light of the economic difficulties that we're facing now, uh, such as the subsidy schemes and infrastructure plans, um, How do we plan with a more balanced view, uh, car versus accessibility for people, the quality of life? How can we leapfrog to the future? As I mentioned before, you can even find in Paris the non-motorized rickshaws and motorized rickshaws being used to diversify the different modes and to promote uh, sustainable transportation and uh, better uh, planned cities. Uh, priorities are very important. Uh, one very good move in this respect is a recent uh, new ministry that was uh, established in Egypt just this year, dedicated to uh, informal settlements. It's called Ministry of Urban Renewal and Informal Settlements. Uh, it's headed by uh, a very nice lady called Dr. Laila Sandar, reminding people always that Cairo is two-thirds informal neighborhoods. And if we're going to talk about formal or the informal part, it's actually one city. And this always has to be repeated and reminded to all of the people, uh, to, to the planner, planners and policy makers. And, and so. Other current debates is, again, uh, should we continue with the old school, uh, civil engineer type of pure just planning for roads and hard infrastructure? Or should we focus more on soft measures and, and uh, uh, smarter, uh, smarter planning? Uh, so roads for prosperity or livable cities for prosperity. And I'm using this, this phrase because road, roads for prosperity was <coughs> a few decades, decades ago in, in the UK was the name of a white paper that was produced by researchers in, uh, in the UK uh, to a result of a study uh, explaining in the white paper how it is important to build more roads to uh, improve the economic uh, growth and to have prosperity in, uh, in the UK. This was during uh, Margaret Thatcher's uh, period. And uh, the result was <coughs> policy policymakers um, uh, in turn um, put forth many plans and programs to expand the road networks and promote this car and vehicle centered uh, way of, of planning your city <coughs> and planning how to reach this prosperity you're looking forward. So, and this is why I use this, this, uh, this word. So are we looking for this, which is completely reversed now in the same country and in many other countries? It's completely reversed. Should we repeat this mindset or should we plan for livable cities for prosperity? Uh, the, by the way, this is a very nice report. I recommend you to read it. It's, it's about uh, several examples of cities that actually improved traffic conditions and the quality of life. 
it's very illustrative, it's nice. By removing expressways and removing urban highways, demolishing the roadways. So it's very counter counterintuitive. But research says that it is uh, it is a true uh, true phenomenon. More roads create something called induced traffic, uh, and removing roads, if implemented with proper uh, policies and other alternatives and programs, can uh, do a lot to improve a city and make it much more livable for for human beings. So, other debates as well. This is very important. Actually, we always forget this. Uh, Egypt is not Cairo. There are many cities in Egypt, of course. Uh, and many cities that are still enjoying a lot of much cleaner air, much more public space. This is a random picture in Minya. Minya is one of the cities uh, upstream the Nile. Uh, and it has very friendly uh, walkways and uh, pedestrian areas. Uh, and it's, it's public, it's free for the poor, there's no minimum charge to sit anywhere. So poor people can enjoy many services. A bit further down, there's a, there's a small like a, a playground for children and so on. The things that we don't see a lot in Cairo anymore because of the four football fields being lost every week, worth of space, being lost to the car, which is serving only 11% of the greater Cairo population. So you can immediately see this, the social inequality in this, in this debate. But fortunately, it's being treated and people are very aware of this. And we are lucky to be doing so in, in Egypt as an example of a mega city that's working hard to, to leapfrog into this paradigm of sustainability. Um, also, among the debates is how to expand the role of civil society. There is a very vibrant civil society in Egypt, and even more even more so after the revolution, there's a lot of creativity, there's a lot of, of, of uh, activism in many issues, uh, one of which is uh, transportation as well, such as suggested in this poster. It says, enough cars, we want walking, cycling, and public transportation. And this is one of many uh, rallies, uh, and there's much more as well, uh, because since 2005, with the empowerment of social media, the, the civil society in Egypt also became very much in power, and a lot of it is very positive. Um, other debates is, okay, so it's a reality. How can we intervene to upgrade and integrate paratransit into formal transit plans? Remember, I was talking about Bogota and, uh, and Medellin and many other projects as well, uh, introducing public transportation to improve, uh, improve the city uh, and reduce the need, the pressure on the car. Uh, but there's always, the question is, when you introduce formal transportation, how do you integrate the reality as well, the paratransit, because they are usually the feeders to the system. So these are, th this is an ecosystem that has to work together. And this is something that is challenging researchers today, and there, are const there is still constant debate about the different ways to integrate it, whether in the planning phase and design and policies and, and, and so on. But one fundamental common factor is the importance of stakeholder consultations. And uh, Bogota is one of these examples because they had uh, multiple years actually of stakeholder consultations with, with all of the uh, major actors in the paratransit sector. Um, so, and when, you, when you're starting to plan how to improve uh, the paratransit and integrate it, uh, you have to have a lot of information about it as suggested by, by the question about how many microbuses or informal paratransit vehicles do we have and there's not yet an answer and it's, it's being addressed now. Uh, it's also being addressed for example in, in Nairobi where they're having uh, this conference I was talking about uh, in a couple of weeks uh, talking about cycling, BRT and other solutions. Uh, this is a nice project that I just wanted to give as an example. The Digital Matatos, there are different names for informal transportation. These are the small buses in Nairobi um, project. So this chaotic system, when mapped, turns out to be actually quite uh, well planned. This is as if a, a, a very good planner has actually made this, this plan. There is a similar study as well that, that made um, a similar study that did the same thing in uh, studying paratransit in South Africa as well. And they showed how modeling paratransit can be used 
with the same algorithms and modeling and logic to, uh, to model formal transportation in, in a case study in Berlin. And they found that the results were actually in many ways similar to the, the, the models that are being used in, in somewhere like Germany. So the, para the paratransit sector is very smart. That's the, the bottom line I want to see. And this is one of the examples of good, nice projects. The last, the last thing I want to talk about the, is the BRT challenge in Egypt. Uh, this, is in, uh, this is in Cairo. Few of you, even Egyptians, would know much about this because it's very recent and it's happening now and still under construction. There are many tram lines being removed and being replaced with a, a vision of a bus rapid transit. Uh, the implementation, we're still scrambling to find the best way to implement it, uh, but in general it, it, it might be a, a good step. Uh, but the biggest debate in this, in this uh, project, introducing BRT in Greater Cairo, is how will you uh, coordinate with the paratransit and how will you have uh, quality that's good enough to attract the car driver because it's not only a social project it's also uh, environmental you want to reduce the space that's taken by cars the fuel consumption by cars and so on so you want to have quality good enough for for the car user but at the same time to have this good quality can you have the fares uh, as high as necessary for the project to be feasible and then you have the social problem uh, coming up so it's sort of a dilemma how to make it economically feasible with decent fares but at the same time cater to the poor people and have a low subsidy uh, and the usual answer is we can have tar targeted subsidies meaning that find the people who need the subsidy give it to them the rest will pay a normal fare but then you have the other argument that will tell you but wait a second 70 million of the 90 million people in this country uh, receive the subsidy card which, which sort of labels them as in need or disadvantaged so it's the, the majority actually so how can you do this cross subsidy, uh, subsidy when, when you have a majority the second thing is the administrative issue how are you going to so there are lots of challenges they have been addressed in other countries in different ways with different varying success rates uh, so, so it is due but, but what I want to show you in, in by explaining this debate is this, is this is what's happening now around the world in many mega cities. There's a lot of talk about how to improve these types of uh, fastly constructed, cheaper uh, public transportation, reduce, reduce the, the need for the car, attract the car user, keep the fares low, but at the same, uh, same time keep the quality high, uh, find ways to have the uh, fare structure that will target the poor, have a decent feasible fare for the rich and so on. Uh, but also very importantly, very importantly, I'll give myself just two more minutes. Uh, how do you integrate land use planning? Because all of the mega cities are growing also in the, in the fringes very, very quickly. So it's very important to integrate properly with, uh, with the new expansions uh, of the city. Um, we're going to have questions in a couple of minutes, so save the questions for... Um, what I want you to come out from this presentation, this is the last slide, uh, are many new terms so that you're aware also of the world of transportation and how the world of transportation is very much related to urban planning, to, to architects who are planning how to design their buildings and their city and, and so on. Um, among these terms are the, the bus traffic transit catching on very quickly, uh, mobility and accessibility versus transportation, the difference in the mindset, um, where the majority of trips, how the majority of trips of the world population, how the majority is happening, um, what are the dilemmas between the social aspects and having feasible projects and how to treat them. Um, what is tra travel demand management, mobility management? What is the meaning of soft measures versus hard measures? And how much can soft measures <coughs> offer? Uh, and how much diversity, appreciation also for how much diversity in thinking you need
need to have happier and more livable cities. And finally, I hope this is also a nice example of a mega city that will st like, stimulate your curiosity, not only about uh, Greater Cairo, but many other uh, cities around the world that are facing similar problems, but are very different, and you really have to dive deep into each individual city to understand the, 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 the many differences in, uh, um, in, their, in their lives and their dynamics. Uh, and with this, I finalize and finish my presentation. So thank you very much. Shall we take questions? Yes, sure. So they don't say I'm biased, choosing Egyptians first. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, just uh, as you said, I think people, uh, the reason for the low car ownership is that people, they cannot afford to buy a car. Yes. Uh, this is one, and the, the also another difficulty is the legislation thing, and the third is, uh, it's too difficult to drive a car, mainly, I mean, I'm talking the masses. Yes. So much traffic, no parking places. But uh, pre presumably we solve this situation and we provide the best public transportation, and suddenly the streets are empty, or like half full. Uh, how much we can count on the awareness of people not to buy more cars? I mean, they will still be craving to buy a car, but they just don't buy cars because they don't want to. That's they a very buy good point. Because they can't. That's uh, a very good point. Um, there, if if there is low car ownership in many of the developing countries, uh, it's usually, as you say, it's it's not to save the environment. It's usually because we can't get the car, but in reality, I want the car. Uh, not me, but as a person in the city. Um, and this is similar to the example, for example, in Cuba when they had an energy crisis, and suddenly there's so much sustainability happening. Organic farming, and cycling, and walking, and for an environmentalist, it's like, wow, and you want to say that this is for the environment. But in reality, it was mainly for energy. Uh, I believe there's there's no problem to have a, a, a synergy. I mean, to hit two birds with one stone, it's uh, it's good. Take advantage of this, and start to promote more sustainable uh, sustainable uh, lifestyles. Uh, an example in Egypt recently, there was even uh, a sudden government endorsement of a five-year process from civil society to lobby for cycling. There was finally different ways of endorsing cycling. Uh, in Egypt, uh, by government officials riding bikes and starting to talk about on television. Suddenly, uh, it was it, it was a lot of it was motivated by by energy and the economic situation, of course. But at the same time, um, it's uh, it, it does a lot of good uh, to the city. So you can take advantage of that. And the job of environmentalists is to strengthen uh, this argument, so that instead of having a, a 20% mode shift, mode shift is another important word for your vocabulary, mode shift, uh, instead of 20%, it can be 50 and 60%. And instead of marketing it to people as uh, for the energy and for the economic uh, burden of subsidies and so on, you can market it as something positive. So you don't have someone switching mode and they're like, okay, it's a cycle. You have someone switching mode and he's happy. So why not do it while you're happy as well? So th this is also a job of, of the, the environmental uh, lobbyists to, uh, to expand on what is already going to happen, to have more of it, and also to market it as something uh, positive. Uh, and as I was just mentioning, mentioning examples of uh, Berlin and Paris and so on, and how they are doing a lot of things that we find in Cairo being done for, for poverty reasons, but it's being done for sustainability reasons elsewhere. Mm -hmm organic farming and so on. This is a very strong message that, hey, wait a second, we're, we're really cool. Uh, this, uh, okay, I'll take questions so we can have time, but uh, I will talk more about this. I have a lot to discuss. Uh, okay, concerning uh, the bus rapid transit that you were talking about, uh, I have heard about this project. It's in uh, Mas City and the Mas Avenida. Um, I think the main issue in Egypt is for uh, like funding these projects are uh, uh, 
the government and not uh, like funded by itself only. Yes. So I want I want to ask you if you have any info concerning uh, the BOT technique or which which, well, which basically basically which. Uh, Program is yeah, you, usually, you, usually it's being done through public-private partnerships, and usually there's there's a big uh, 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 soft loan, like a development loan involved. Loan. And, uh, and in this case, uh, I don't know about the current BRT, but before the BRT, there was a tram line yeah, being tram. proposed, and the tram line was going to be implemented with a, with a loan from the World Bank, uh, and then uh, and then uh, probably it was still too expensive to justify, uh, so. There are talks now about uh, bus rapid transit. Uh, it seems to be led by government funding with a very low budget uh, approach. Uh, but th there are many different uh, ways ways to deal with this. So there is not like an op uh, like um, a good way or the best the best way to uh, fund it because I think that the main problem is the funding issue. Yes. It, it depends on the country. Yeah. Uh, there is a lot of material on this in. Uh, I showed an example of, from the ITDP, yeah. uh, the Institute for Transportation Development uh, Policy. Uh, in their publications, I have a direct link to it in my presentation, in their publications they have a lot of guidelines of all of the contractual arrangements that can be done. And it's a sea of information drawing from case studies from many places of the world. What's a, what, what, what went wrong in Jakarta and Lagos and what went right in Mexico or in, uh, uh, or in Bogota or in Curtiva and so on and what are the different lessons because you, have, you always have different uh, contexts. Yeah. Uh, so search for the ITDP uh, report. It's, uh, I find it interesting that um, what, what we can see and learn from Cairo is, is a context of I would believe high social inequality, like many of those cities where the BRT has been introduced to. Yes. So if we look at statistics of, of, of the voted split, for instance, then um, maybe if you only have 11% of households in Cairo uh, using a car, the reality might be there is a very few number of households who even have two or more cars and uh, much, many, many more who don't have a car at all. So that inequality uh, might be represented uh, not in that statistic of 11% where you need to see uh, where is actually the accumulation and where not. And I think what, what was raised, what you raised with the problem the RT faces and what one of you raised uh, earlier on was um, you have on the one hand uh, that the car is the status symbol and it has to do with the lifestyle and it seems it's very difficult to overcome that from one day to the other so um, and we have the same in Germany I think we've got the first generation where the automobile industry is struggling now because we don't want to have cars anymore yeah? yes. and that has effects on the economy again so there's an interconnectedness and on the other range of that social inequality um, you have something which has emerged by itself out of necessity and survival, so a system which catered because the state didn't deliver an alternative, maybe, I don't, I don't know, in Cairo, but settlements uh, grew, grew on the outskirts and there needed to be some kind of mobility catered. Now what I have um, learned in, in, in Cape Town, and that might also be an issue, is that all of a sudden two systems clash. You have that paratransport system, which has developed, and now you introduce PRT, uh, and it's in conflict with one another, because the one wants actually to substitute the other. Yes. Uh, and I was wondering if that is not also a central concern. On the one hand, how do you get people with another lifestyle interested in using it? And on the other hand, uh, yes. how does the PRT you know, it's not that it's just interlinked with the parent uh, transfer, but then it has to clash. So, so that's a very nice sum up of the dilemma that I was trying to, uh, to bring across earlier. The, the dilemma of uh, you essentially want to attract the car user to a very high quality so, so they can use it. And you need affairs that make the project feasible as well. But then the majority will need the targeted subsidy. So 
are the people who will be attracted, who will do the mode shift, are they enough to enable this cross-subsidy or not? Uh, or should we just continue to subsidize the transportation very uh, as, as much as, as we do today, or maybe just gradually increase? What's being? Mm -hmm. so, sorry, but not only between the, the individual household, uh, let's say a low-income household, to be, um, that it affords that kind of system, but between the two systems, I, I just to give you this idea, yes. of South Africa, basically the minibus taxi industry uh, forced the BRT to have higher prices so that they could still exist, because mm -hmm. otherwise a whole uh, informal industry would die down. Dies and out. They, were, they were basically shooting at the BRT buses yes. because of this. Uh, so. there, there have been even gunfights in Bogota as well. Yeah. So even in the success stories, the most successful, uh, there, there are a lot of, uh, there is a lot of trouble from uh, people who make a living and suddenly uh, they're, they're very threatened. Uh, and this is why I, I really stressed on stakeholder consultation. Mm -hmm. It's very important to plan together because at the end of the day, the planning is for everyone. So, listening to everyone and just putting everything on the table. Well, this is the problem. This is how much fuel we have. This is this is the modal share. These are the numbers of vehicles. This is the trajectory, and so on. And we'll have better lives for everyone. And how do we find uh, synergies and win-win situations uh, through this? Um, and. The, the intermodal integration is a fundamental part of planning bus rapid transit. Intermodal between not only the bus rapid transit and the paratransit, which is the most difficult of them, but also between other public transit, between the, the BRT, which is a, a very much of a challenge in Egypt as well, because it's, it's a very old city, 5,000 years old, it's already established and you can't tear down... Uh, actually, it's difficult even to dig for the metro because uh, in, in, when you're digging for the metro you have to coordinate with the Ministry of, of Antiquities to make sure that you don't run into any antiquities, any mummies coming up in the way or anything. So, so even digging is, is very difficult. Space is becoming very precious in, uh, in magazines. So intermodal integration within public transport is one challenge and then the bigger one also is, is uh, with paratransit. And I would argue that with gradual regulation and getting more information about paratransit, uh, you have to start with information. And this is actually one of my motives for doing my PhD about the paratransit, because this is a place where there's a lot of gaps uh, exactly for that reason. Uh, okay, two things maybe I'll uh, continue on what Astrid was saying. Because, yeah, of course, having the uh, the car is still uh, something that's prestigious, but I think in our generation in Cairo it's starting to, or there's at least a seed that it's slowing down. Uh, so people in their 20s and maybe mid 30s, a lot of them, and again I'm talking about the rich class and maybe the upper middle class, are starting to buy scooters. Yes. A lot of them, and even uh, cheap Chinese or Malaysian uh, scooters. And this never happens with this class because no one from the uh, rich class or middle class or upper uh, middle class will uh, buy or drive a Chinese car. This will never happen. So this, I think it, it's happening slowly, this yes. idea. And it has a lot of economical and, of course, uh, traffic-related uh, reasons. The other thing uh, I'm wondering about is the uh, bus uh, rapid uh, transit. Uh, I want to know if you have any speculations of the, not the efficiency, but like how much will how does it serve the people? Okay. No, no, I mean, is that the only plan for the next 10 20 years? Is there mm. another system will be uh, uh, like superimposed on it or not? And the other thing is with the, the satellite cities, also, are this yeah, because that's also that's, a bigger that's, problem. That's and you're talking about cross town traffic, yes, yes, yes. I'll take the first comment first. Uh, you talked about uh, actually things are changing. So the same way we're seeing uh, uh, interest in lic uh, driving license decreasing in countries like Germany and elsewhere uh, as an identity, as a status symbol and so on, it's, it's, it's going down in many developed countries. Some theories say that it's because people are using other symbols of identity and other things and 
plus the incentives and disincentives in place, plus the media and the promotion and being green and cool and all so many things. Uh, in Egypt as well, and you mentioned the, the, the richer classes, uh, I would argue that a lot of it has to do with, uh, with uh, social, uh, social activism, the civic uh, engagement. Uh, things like rallies like this one for, for climate change and for transportation, mobility and cycling. Since 2006 till now, uh, there have been so many groups, not only in Cairo, for, for cycling, like Cairo Cyclers Club, like uh, uh, MTB Mountain Biking, and many other types of clubs, nighttime cycling, and so on. So many, so many uh, cycling clubs are expanding very, uh, very quickly in Egypt. Uh, plus other, uh, other initiatives, such as for scooters, which, which started mostly in, in Alexandria, uh, by, by someone actually who's also a friend of mine uh, who's also cycling active. So uh, civic engagement had a very big role in branding uh, healthier life lifestyles. Uh, and the result is that you noticed it right now and this is something that says uh, you're doing a good job, so <laughs> that's good. Uh, secondly about the BRT and what will happen in the future in Egypt. Uh, the economic Difficulties are, are very challenging, but I would, I would repeat an idea that Jaime Lerner in Curitiba uh, said uh, before, the, the mayor that made one of the flagship projects in BRT, uh, uh, that when you're in times of difficulty, this is when you're most creative. Uh, and I believe that uh, in, in the days that we're going through right now, in, in Cairo and many other cities, uh, I think when it, when the, when the going gets tough, the tough get going, you know, the, the tough get creative and so on. It's it's a bit like uh, sometimes I have a picture of a car in Germany after the, the World War when everybody was having economic problems and the car is being fueled with uh, uh, waste. It's like one of those Back to the Future cars. There was so much innovation because of this uh, crisis. Uh, and I believe in terms of urban planning, in terms of, uh, of how we plan, the paradigm that we're thinking uh, through this framework can, can change dramatically uh, because of a, of a crisis. We can choose to change it to the worse or to the better, to be happy while, while we're doing it or not and so on. Uh, but it's, uh, it's definitely an opportunity and we do see the results. Um, I would like to share our uh, problem in Amman. Um, it's not a huge city, it's probably as big as one neighborhood in Cairo, but uh, we have this problem of the traffic jam. We have um, relatively low car ownership, but it's increasing 20% each year. So with this traffic jam we had and um, uh, streets aren't really prepared for this uh, uh, number of cars, they started the BRT project a few years ago. And uh, they decided to start it with one of the busiest streets, which is the one leading to the University of Jordan, a very huge university with thousands of students going there every day and a lot of traffic jam. So they started this project. They hired expertise from all over the world. They took loans. They had the good fund. They made studies. And then they started making the BRT lanes. So they went to the street that had around like five or six lanes in the street, and they reduced it to two lanes, uh, and the other lanes were for the BRT. And uh, we went through months with the traffic jam because of the detours and the construction work. And afterwards, after it was completed and we were waiting for the bus to come to start the project, they said, oh, sorry, there's um, lack of studies. It's not going to work out. And now <laughs> the BRT lane is there, but there's no bus. And the street yes. that once fitted six lanes now is only two lanes. And so now we have more traffic issues. Mm -hmm. and, and, and this happened in many cities. Yes, so it's, it's always the same in Jordan. Yeah. We have two master theses of the first in tech yes. and see who gets that topic in Amman. Oh, yeah. so. <laughs> That's good. Um, and this is exactly, this is a very good, very interesting input. This is exactly why I was saying a bit earlier in this picture, let's see, of the BRT in Bogota, that the BRT is not this what you see, it's not just this, it is much more. There were at least three uh, 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 mayors 
before, two, uh, two mayors before Enrique Peñalosa was the star of the celebrity of the mayor. But there were two, two or three periods, political cycles before them, that were uh, fixing, sorting the finances of the, of the city and sorting the institutional setup of the city and, and fixing a lot of things, reducing the crime, gathering information and, and many things. So there were many cycles that happened before what you see. What you see here is just a picture, but there is a lot being done, for example, integrating messages about transportation in school books, the educative system and so on, or uh, addressing people through the media a few years in advance, uh, many other measures, uh, improving the policies to, to enable cycling and walking uh, and other measures that will enable the alternative diversity of the modes. So it's not just bus rapid transit, it's not just this final picture, but it's much more. What happens in many cities is that someone comes up and he says, I want in my own political cycle to have this, oh, this the BRT transform Bogota or Curitiba, I'm going to do the same thing. BRT, and they are not aware, they have no appreciation of the diversity of measures that are being done to enable the success of the city. The, the, this is a, a, an upgrade of the city, it's not a one transportation infrastructure project. It is much more than the engineering that you see. And, and this, is why, this is why sometimes, uh, if, it's, if it's not done correctly, with all of this lining up, it's just BRT and that's all. And this might happen in Egypt as well, but we have to make sure it doesn't happen. Uh, and in, in other cities as well. Uh, I want to ask, because um, you showed a graphic with the car ownerships of, uh, of the world. And for example, there was a number about Canada. And Canada, it's, uh, as we all suppose, a really cold country yes. yeah, about weather and then you also showed this map where all the world it was uh, with these mega cities and mostly of them are uh, for example Cairo and those kind of cities Low. are lower and yes. have for example a better temperature or better climate yes. uh, situation so I want to ask um, if you consider in your in your uh, research those kind of aspect that maybe it, it's not it doesn't have to do with the um, of the city inside but <coughs> maybe with the climate change and how does the climate influence and how the people will move in this case for example in Canada because of the weather or the cold maybe they use more cars and how it goes through Cairo because it maybe it's too hot. Yes, I don't know. Yes. Uh, do you, did you consider that, that also? That, uh, that's, a, that's a good point. Uh, it is always considered in, in transportation planning the impact of topography, the impact of uh, the climate uh, and, and seasonal variations as well uh, in, in the climate. Uh, for example, there are some uh, cities of developed countries that are trying hard to promote uh, to promote cycling, which should be uh, normal in, in Europe, uh, but they have the difficulty of landscapes, for example. I, I think Norway is one of them. Um, uh, but there are cities that have a landscape uh, challenge, uh, or have a seasonal variation that doesn't allow them to easily cycle in certain periods. But um, the idea is when you have diverse options, it makes it much easier to choose between so diversity is, is, is fundamental to this, but it's definitely true. Uh, you're asking if I consider it in, in my study. Uh, uh, I do as well, because I'm not just interested in paratransit, but also how people access paratransit. Uh, the, uh, for example, in the, the picture I showed, showed at the end of the presentation, uh, it shows the BRT line that is being planned yeah, here, uh, being planned in Egypt. Uh, this is before implementing the BRT. So the, the tuk-tuks, they took advantage of the space that suddenly appeared, and they built a station. It's a very organized station, as you see. It's, it's 
quite organized, and people know where they're going to go, and there, there are even signs for, for, uh, for the different stations. And it's the same, the same in South Africa. There's actually, I think, PhD or master thesis just on uh, different hand signs and the cultural background to the hand signs and all of that. Um, it's, it's quite organized, and they took advantage uh, of the space. And these tuk-tuks, they go all the way uh, down this road to Esbet el maybe you know this, an informal settlement that is one of the biggest in, in the world, actually. Um, and they provide access to the people to this uh, informal settlement that has close to a million uh, inhabitants. Um, so, access to the different modes of paratransit is very important as well, and, and I'm also researching into that. Uh, and then comes the walking trip, or the cycling trip, and maybe there are other modes as well. Uh, also, another aspect is, uh, is the commuter himself. Is it, what are the gender differences uh, in, in mobility? Lots of indicators about that. What are the influence of your age, demographic position? Uh, so it's not just the economic uh, aspects or your location or neighborhood, but also you yourself and how your behavior is. Uh, and I'm focusing on specifically that the travel behavior and what are the things that influence uh, I was wondering whether there is any connection between the travel behavior and the informal organization of the traffic and and um, digital tools which somehow enable some kind of sharing or knowledge of where these actually are going because for me as an outsider of course if you live somewhere and you go daily just to the same destination of course after a while you will find out okay this is the bus that stops here which yes. will take me there but to have any kind of transportation that is um, possible for people to use if they go to different places and then having to find their way. Of course, this puts a great challenge in terms of not knowing where to change and what other vehicles to take. And I'm always wondering how then people still find their way. Is it only through communication or are there any digital tools as people are quite young and quite active in using yes. social media? Yes. And especially in Germany, this is one of the main drivers, as you mentioned, of people not using the car or being so car dependent because they now, through their mobile devices, they get all the knowledge of where to rent a car, to go, how to then uh, change to the bike, so it's all it's all about knowledge, which before was not available, and this now, through these modern technologies, opens these opportunities, which then go beyond just the idea of ownership, but go in the direction of yeah, just knowing how and where yes. and how to share and, and in this way being even more flexible because you don't even need to find a parking space which in some cases in cities can take more time than the actual travel time and then you just optimize yes. your uh, resources and decisions and then it's still faster and at least you know what to do but here of course it's very kind of yeah especially as an outsider how to find your way and how to then reach a certain destination I'm glad you brought this up. How how is the digital age influencing the paratransit and other modes of transportation as well? Um, and well, the answer is mainly as you already uh, your impression is already correct. That it's mainly through communication. The, the culture of getting around is you you get trained on it and you know your ways around the country. You ask people and communication is very frequent. I mean if. When I'm getting on the microbus, I'm sitting at the back, for example, and I'm paying, uh, each person collects the money from the person behind him. And th there are some dynamics. And then I went to, uh, to the, car, the car once, and I took the microbus in the car, and I found the hand signals, I found the way of payment, uh, the same communication between people, all these people asking each other where to go. Uh, and there are some positive aspects, actually, to this. The social interactions in itself sometimes makes the journey uh, interesting for, for many people. Um, so, so this is also nice. But then, again, if you want an outside, if you want to attract the car user, you also want information. And this is one of the motives of the entrepreneurs that uh, worked on the digital status project in Nairobi. Um, if you remember from the slide, it's, it's a digital map of all of the routes of the, the Mandatos, where, where they go and their stations. 
apparently there is a map and it's consistent. Uh, so uh, maybe there's no schedule, but the frequency is so frequent that you don't need a schedule, and maybe it's not much added value for you to have a, a, add a to have a schedule if it's very frequent anyway. You just wait for a couple of minutes. Um, so th this is starting to uh, play a role. Also, the penetration of smartphones, mobile phones, of course, I think it's beyond, beyond the 100 percent. Uh, but smartphones are being uh, are penetrating the market very uh, very quickly as well. So we're we're expecting as well in the future to start noticing uh, impacts from, from smartphones on on even uh, even power transit. Uh, and there are apps being developed uh, being developed informally uh, for uh, for the metro and for the buses and for car sharing and other uh, not by public agencies but by. Uh, by entrepreneurs and, and mostly young uh, young people developing apps, uh, and it's definitely a very interesting research uh, research area. So uh, when you go to Egypt, just ask around yes. <laughs> and enjoy the social experience <laughs> and learn a few uh, a few signs and uh, <laughs> like take some pictures. And you will never get it. It will be fun. There's actually two applications, but they're not exactly related to uh, informal uh, transportation. Uh, there is one for cabs, where you just click that you uh, use your GPS, and then you click that you need to be picked up from there, and then the cab driver can just come to you. Of course, it's not really that nice because the cab driver is using his phone while he's driving. Uh, the other one, I don't know if you how much familiar you are with Cairo, but there is this application called the Olag. But it's also morely, uh, primarily uh, targeting private cars. Uh, and it has pretty much all the roads in Cairo, and it tells you if it's uh, congested, uh, congested or not, or if there's construction, or to avoid something. Uh, yeah, and actually the guy, one of the guys, the entrepreneurs, he is also one of the initiatives of the uh, scooters. He was, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, yeah. Uh, and he's also an architect, a very successful architect, and by that I mean he never worked as an architect. <laughs> uh, but yeah, actually it's huge now, and they have partnership with Vodafone and Chad. Yeah, yeah. uh, it, it's an app that crowdsources information about traffic. It's very simple. And uh, people and voids your exposure to congestion. Yeah. There's a question about uh, As for the cycling in Egypt, I just uh, want to make sure it's I, I consider it as a way of power transit as well, or informal way for dealing with transportation. But in, we consider it as an elite way. Mainly in Alexandria, we use bikes and, uh, just because we are overwhelmed by yes. that. Uh, I'll tell you something about Alexandria. You will find a lot of people that are, or, or you will miss finding a lot of people that are using bikes yeah. as a normal commute. Yeah. There are lots of people using bikes. Not as the rebranded yeah. cycling, but normal. But you are you are probably going with the Alexandria Cycling Carnival or Cycling Alexandria or Ahmed Hitu and all of this. Kind. No, on a daily basis. On a, on a daily yeah. on a daily yeah. uh, basis. Um, but but you are not welcomed on the streets. You are you are using your bike on the cars la lanes mm -hmm. on the daily basis. So it's it's a kind of informal. Ah okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. When we say paratransit, is paratransit to to Informally supply transportation for others. So, yeah. uh, like the motorcycle in Fayoum, another uh, one of the poor governorates, the motorcycle taxi, it, it providing transportation. But when it's when it's your own bike and you're using it, then uh, I wouldn't label it as paratransit yeah, because you're not, unless you're hiring them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not yet, but maybe uh, cycling rickshaws. Uh, but then you're mentioning an important thing that there is no uh, infrastructure for cycling. So yeah. how can how can the government be endorsing cycling without providing infrastructure? And the sort of good news is that the, this intention is starting to be translated into implementation. And one of the examples is uh, Munufeya in Chiminakum uh, and in Fayoum, where there are actually already uh, uh, plans to start uh, building the uh, cycling lanes. And um, if I'm not mistaken, the, the construction uh, is completed already of Shibinik uh, or in process. So it's actually on the ground. It's not, I'm not talking about only blueprint. But there is construction being done for 
both urban upgrading and cycling lanes. Uh, and these good examples, hopefully, will be contagious and start replicating other governorates as well. Uh, but before this, what is very important is what you have done, that you actually cycle. Because it's because of you and because of this uh, persistence to have a healthier lifestyle uh, that the government will start to react. If you have more people uh, cycling, you start building a critical mass, and then the government uh, starts responding to that. And this is actually happening. <coughs> is that? But, but uh, at some point, some <laughs> people me. get exhausted from the, the bad uh, infrastructure and yeah. just give up. So uh, if yeah. the government didn't act fast, mm -hmm. they will I lose understand. that yeah. massive. Yes, yes. Yeah. If, they, if they don't act fast enough, you will lose a lot of, yeah. uh, a lot of people. Uh, unfortunately, with activists, the first people who start, the people in transition to, to a better world, the people in transition are always the people who uh, sacrifice a bit, uh, who suffer most. Even if you're not just environmentalism, think about uh, I don't know, uh, feminism or uh, any other uh, different types of political activism and so on. Uh, people who are doing this transition are the people who have this need this persistence and they suffer more but they enjoy more that they are really changing the world to the better. I can give you an example. Uh, there's a girl called Bofe uh, Beheri, I think. Uh, she recently published a book uh, called uh, Memoirs of a Girl Cycling in Egypt. Uh, and we invited her uh, to, to our events and so on. Uh, this is this is a milestone, I think, in the history of promoting sustainable transport, specifically cycling. Uh, because uh, you had a girl that put so much effort into this ch uh, change of lifestyle, and this much effort to also promote it and spread uh, the message. Uh, so I think this book is is, uh, is an example of uh, of how this activism will change uh, the way we are doing our. Urban time. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I have. Okay. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much.